and grace and peace be yours in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. If you take a poll of Americans and ask, how many of you believe in God? Those numbers come back depending on what source you look at. But the ones that I relied upon told me that 20 years ago, the number of Americans who identified as atheists was 6%. 20 years ago, it was 6%. But if you take that poll now, it's 15%. Atheists are the fastest growing religious group, so to speak, in America. In a little bit more than 20 years, more than doubling, more than doubling. That's a disturbing enough trend, but that's actually a little bit of a confusing trend because we could say, how many people say that there is no God? When the truth is there's a lot of Americans who are actually theists. They think there is a God, but they're pretty ambivalent about who he is. And you've heard this comment. All gods are the same one God, right? There is a God, but you can call him by different names. So this God and that God and this other God and these different groups, it's all the same God. That's not biblical faith, right? That's not what the Bible's saying in the least, but we need to know we live in a world where a lot of Americans, that's closer to 40% of Americans, say that all gods are the same. And if you do that, you wind up at the same place, and that is this. You should try hard to be a good person. Right? Many people will say, there's one God, call him whatever name you want, and try to be a good person. And the Bible's not saying that either, is it? So I want us to get on a Trinity Sunday that the Bible is saying there is one God and there is no other, and that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no other, right? Now, the Old Testament is very clear that there's only one God. Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods. Isaiah 42, verse 8, I will not give my glory to another, God says. Deuteronomy 6, 4 is the Shema. That's the Old Testament statement of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you were a faithful believer in the Old Testament, you were supposed to say that seven times a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How many gods are there? one and he will not he will not give his glory to another now we want to get that israel's god is one but i want us to notice this on a trinity sunday there's something fishy going on with israel's god isn't there i want to say even in the old testament there's something fishy going on there's one god and yet from time to time a little bit of a plurality starts to creep in And I want to look at it through the lens of three men that God spoke through here. They are Moses, Isaiah, and Daniel. Try these out. How many gods? One. But listen to Genesis 1, verses 1 to 3. Beginning words of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God did that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God made everything. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I'm not going to read all of verse 3. I just want the first three words. It's this. And God said, I want to pause there because I want to notice this. If you say something, you're speaking a word, and the New Testament tells us that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. I know that's pretty subtle, but I think that that's an implication of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, it's a hint, right? It's a hint. There's one God, but something's going on. Genesis 1:26, same chapter, and God said, let us make man in our image. Here's something I had to stare at the text in Hebrew for a long, long time to notice, but I always think it's fun to notice it once you do see it. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's English. In Hebrew, that is a verse with seven words. Seven words. 
And in Hebrew, there's a little mark that they put in the text. It happens throughout all the verses that lets you know, here's the first half of the verse, here's the second half of the verse. And that marking of the half doesn't mean just word count. It means here's one of the ideas in the verse and here's the second ideas, no matter the length of them. But I want us to hear this, that little mark, there's seven words in Genesis 1-1 in Hebrews. That little mark happens with three words in the first half and four words in the second half. Now hear it in English again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the heavens and the earth, that's the creation. How many words? Four words. How many points on the map? Four, right? North, south, east, west. Isn't that funny that even the Bible says God created everything that exists, the heaven and the earth, and he uses the number four. We say the four corners of the world. I think that goes way back to there. But this is the other thing. In the beginning, God created. In Hebrew, that's three words. That's the half of the verse that's about God. How many words? Three words. Is that a hint? Israel has one God, but there's something about the number three with him. That's Genesis 1. That's Moses. Isaiah 6, a wonderful text, the call of Isaiah. I love the way it begins. In the year that King Uzziah died, what a great place to begin, right? And we want to know this. Uzziah was a good king. Uzziah was a godly man who pursued, pursued the ways of the Lord. But every time Israel had a king, they always wondered, is this man the savior? Is Uzziah the savior? No, because the text begins with these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, good king, but you know what else he is? He's a man, right? Just a man. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah thinks that, but he turns his attention then to God. King Uzziah died, he's not the savior. Next words, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. Right? That is good for us to know, by the way. God reigns and no man, right? Hear that again, God reigns and no man. So he sees this vision of heaven. God grants him a vision of heaven. Seraphim are flying around. The root word for seraphim is the Hebrew word saraf. It means to burn. We paint pictures of angels as being lovely. I don't know, what does seraphim look like if the verb is to burn this fiery flaming creature that flies through the heavens with six wings and when they speak the building shakes what are they saying holy 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 is the lord the god of israel how many gods does israel have but one but how do they describe him he's holy 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 it always makes you wonder, what did the prophets know, right? It's a hint from God. Israel has one God, but that God is holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah, getting all that's going on, says, woe is me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I say things I shouldn't say. I live among a people of unclean lips. They say things they shouldn't say. Well, that's not new. And I want us to notice this. The Bible is always sacramental, right? The sacraments are when God does spiritual things through a physical means. Isaiah probably should have wished he didn't say, I'm a man of unclean lips, because doesn't the angel take a burning coal off the altar and a set of tongs and touch it to his mouth? Here, this has touched your lips. Now you're clean. That's a great text. There's something fishy about Israel's God in Moses and in Isaiah. How about Daniel chapter 7? In Daniel chapter 7, God has given Daniel a vision of four beasts, the kingdoms of the world, the empires that men build to oppress people. And he's thinking about those things. And while he's thinking about them, his vision shifts to God. Verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The Ancient of Days, the one that's existed since forever. Who is that? That's God. 
Again, he's contemplating the mess that the world is, and he looks to heaven and he says, thrones are set in place. God himself took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire. There's that again, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, 10,000s times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. That's Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. God is on his throne. And just for a minute, as um, Daniel lowers his vision again and sees some of the kingdoms are speaking boastfully and listens to their, their boasts and their pushing of themselves and their agendas. And he has to turn back to God, verse 13. I want us to hear this. God on his throne, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Who's that? Jesus. The Ancient of Days is sitting on his throne, and he says, I see one like a son of man, hear the description, coming with the clouds of heaven. He's divine. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshiped him. The Bible's very clear, worship the Lord only. But the Son of Man comes and all peoples and nations worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What is Daniel seeing? The Godhead, the Heavenly Father, and the Son coming into his presence to be worshiped. Daniel's been a monotheist his whole life, vigorously worshiping the one true God, and the Son of Man comes and is worshiped by all people. What does he think of it? It's startling, in case you were wondering, the text tells us the very next verse. Daniel sees that, and he says, verse 15, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. Yes. One God, but he's holy, holy, holy. One God, but he says, let us make man in our image. One God, but the Son of Man is worshipped. That's the Old Testament. Right? That's the Old Testament. The Old Testament was hinting. There's one God, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I want us to notice, when we get over to John chapter 3, that familiar passage of Jesus and Nicodemus, have you ever noticed that in that passage it's Trinitarian? We're used to hearing John 3, 16. I want us to notice that Jesus, in speaking to Nicodemus, is Trinitarian. He says this first, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The kingdom of who? The kingdom of God, there's the Father. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And Nicodemus is like, how does that work? You can't go back to the womb. And this, Jesus then says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Wait a minute. Kingdom of God? But the Spirit gives birth. And Nicodemus still doesn't get it. And so Jesus goes on, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. There's all three persons of the Trinity. We read that chapter and memorize John 3.16. We should, it's a great verse. But do we notice that Jesus in talking to Nicodemus says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for your salvation. Jesus makes it very clear later, Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now it's clear enough for us in the name, that's one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, having said all that, I want to conclude with this idea. The basic message of the Bible is this. It's God is for you. Right? That's the basic message of the Bible. God is for you, not against you. In the other religions, it's not clear, right? The other religions make clear if you are good enough, God might save you. The Bible says none of us are good enough, but God will save you because that's who He is and what He does. 
So when I say Trinity, I don't want us to hear just Trinity as a doctrine. The Trinity is the message that God, this God, is for you. Hear these things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created me. He gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, all my members, my reason, and all my senses. He still takes care of them. What am I quoting? The catechism, right? God made me. And I believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, and purchased and won me with his holy, precious blood. That Christ has saved me. And I believe that the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. The Holy Spirit has called me. It's not just facts to know. Please understand God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, of course, that's true. But it's to know that, to know that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is for you. It's for you, right? It's not just a doctrine. The biblical truth is God is this God. There is no other, but he's this God for your benefit and your salvation. Like I said with the kids, God has made me. God has saved me. God has called me. Because God is for me. Amen. And we stand together. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.